Good morning uh, from New York City uh, today. Uh, my name is Brian Marr. I'm the Chief of the Ophthalmic Oncology Service at Columbia University in New York City. Uh, I've been treating retinoblastoma for the last 20 years, uh, first 10 years I was at Will's Eye Hospital and after that I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering where we kind of inter introduced modern intraarterial chemotherapy and launched that as a, a new intraocular technique. Now currently Chief of uh, Ophthalmic Oncology at Columbia. I'm going to talk to you today about um, tools to treat intraocular retinoblastoma. So really when we treat intraocular retinoblastoma we have a limited number of tools that we have to use, and we have to kind of know what these tools do, know when to use them appropriately, uh, and that way we can kind of craft uh, our treatment to um, deal with the really intricate differences that you have between uh, eyes and children, because not every eye is the same. Um, so we can't just use one, <coughs> excuse me, we can't just use one tool to, to treat every type of retinoblastoma, it would be nice. Um, but just like you can't take a screwdriver and build a whole house, you kind of need a screwdriver to build a house, but you can't build a whole house with it. Same with the tools with retinoblastoma. So what I'm gonna do today is kind of break down the different tools that we have to treat intraocular retinoblastoma. Um, and we really have about five things that we use and some variations that we have lasers, we have freezing treatment, we have different types of chemotherapy, we have surgery, and we have radiation. And these are kind of the five groups that we're gonna talk about a little bit in detail uh, on how to use them, what they're appropriate for. So if you look at the slides, I'm gonna have them broke down to kind of a pretty simple way of you know, each tool and then how, uh, well, what we wanna use it for, the benefits, what it does well, the limitations kind of what it doesn't do well or some of the side effects that's associated with it kind of give you these little schematic diagrams of uh, what an eye looks like and what type of tumors are well treated with it. Um, and so that's going to be kind of the format for each tool that we're going to talk about today. So we'll start with lasers. So lasers are um, focal treatments that we can use for small uh, tumors, but it's, it's important that you have the correct laser and you use it correctly. So I like to use a 810 nanometer, which is a diode laser infrared that has a large spot size. And the reason for that is when I treat the tumors, I treat the entire tumor uh, and we cover it with the largest spot. If you use a really small um, spot, like in the green laser, it's harder to get bigger tumors and they're a little bit less effective. So the way that the laser works is it basically creates a thermal effect. Uh, the energy is absorbed by the RPE that heats up underneath the tumor, right? Because these are retinal tumors and really most of the energy is transferred to the RPE or the pigmented uh, tissue. And then that thermal effect rises up and then denatures the, the retina above it. And so you have to kind of remember that. So if you see a nice uptake underneath a tumor, uh, it may not be enough to actually kill the tumor because you're actually just causing most of the energy change in the RPE. So you want to make sure that you kind of look three-dimensionally and make sure that your uh, laser spot um, and, and the thermal energy propagates to the inner retina so you kill the whole tumor. So it's a little trick that you do. But these are, are, are important. Uh, to know these things. So what are, what's laser good for? Well, it's for small posterior tumors, right? Small subretinal seeds. It's really good for early stage disease. So if you have a patient that has a, a known family history and you screen them early and you notice small tumors, then you can treat it with laser and you won't need any other uh, uh, treatments. Uh, the benefits is that it takes a few minutes. It's really precise. So where you aim the beam is where you treat. Uh, there's no systemic toxicity. Uh, really, if you do it correctly, there's a low rate of complications. Now, you don't want to hit the iris with the, the beam because uh, that can cause cataract. It can cause iris atrophy. It can cause inflammation, pain. Um, you have to be experienced in losing it. So one of the downsides is it does take a little learning curve to get good with it. Uh, and so you have to kind of uh, be careful, um, practice, um, and you know, kind of get that feel of 
when your uptake is correct. And it's gonna vary on the pigmentation of your patient. So if you have a really light skinned patient with a rarely blonde fundus, the energy that you're gonna use is a lot uh, more than if you have a dark skinned patient with a dark fundus. So I usually start my power at about 200 milliwatts and then titrate depending on the uptake. Um, and that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a cursory view of laser. <clears throat> Here's some examples of you can see that these are uh, tumors that were treated. There's three tumors uh, in the right eye of a patient. And you can see the uptake as you look carefully at the second one off the inferior arcade. You can see that the uh, retina has actually changed color involving the and covering the vessel that goes through it. So you know that you got your thermal energy into the uh, inner retina. And so that's important. You can kind of use blood vessels as gauge. Surprisingly, if you look at the post-treatment, that that blood vessel didn't include. And so uh, in these young patients, you can actually give a pretty good amount of power and not cause a vein occlusion. So if you look closely at the before and after, you see that vein that was covered up with uh, a white uptake actually is still patent. So the important part is to treat it thoroughly uh, and it may take more than one treatment. So you can come back in a month and if it looks like there's still a little bit of residual uh, tissue there three-dimensionally, uh, then I would retreat. So that's kind of the before and afters of laser treatment for small tumors for intraocular retinoblastoma. Uh, it, laser can also be used as an adjunct for systemic chemotherapy. So if you have a large tumor, the systemic chemotherapy will shrink it down to a point, but then there's, a, there's residual fish flesh or residual uh, tissue that makes you uncomfortable. It may not be viable. It may be viable. You don't know, and depending on the frequency of your follow-up, you really don't want that tissue to propagate. And so at the time of each interval of chemotherapy, you can add uh, adjuvant laser therapy. And you can see in the before and after with a combination of chemotherapy and laser that this is a, a well-regressed type one uh, regression of that tumor. So it can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy as an adjunct. It can also be used by itself for larger tumors after treatment with chemotherapy that don't respond the way you want them to. And so we've used uh, uh, ICG where we infuse a child during the exam with ICG, which increases the uptake of the tumor. And then you treat it with laser and you have a better, out, uh, a better uptake. So a lot of the times in, in lightly colored funduses or uh, tumors that are on calcified scars, you'll notice that the uptake of the laser is not as good as if it's a small tumor on the RPE. So you're increasing your laser power, but you're not getting the response you want. If that's the case, if you add ICG, then you can get a better response. And here's a paper that we put together while I was at Sloan showing the effects of uh, ICG in regression of these tumors. And it actually works fairly well. Um, and it's a good kind of trick to know to make your laser a little bit more effective. So let's have the statistics on how well laser works. Well, there's really no definitive paper on how laser works by itself. Usually it's done in addition to other treatments because rarely do we ever have uh, the one focal lesion. And if we do, it's kind of in the, the setting of a, a, a multifocal disease. So no one really actually publishes on it. So you know, it, the control rate goes anywhere from zero to 100%. And so there's some of these references here that you'll have uh, kind of go through that, but basically it's really effective when it's used, i.e. In, in combination with chemotherapy or by itself, if you pick the correct tumors. So small tumors do very well with uh, laser by itself. Larger tumors need the help of chemotherapy or even chemotherapy therapy plus ICG, and that's a, a kind of a spectrum of what you can do with the laser. So it's usually a helper, not a sole treatment modality, except for the small tumors. So what do you do when you have a larger tumor? Well, um, freezing treatment or cryotherapy uh, is a great way to take care of um, bigger tumors. So this is a handheld probe initially designed for repair of retinal breaks. And you position it on the eye 
uh, right underneath where your tumor is. And then once it's in position and you scleral to press the tumor, uh, you step on the pedal, it freezes the tumor, and you wanna make sure the ice ball completely uh, covers the tumor, and then you'll thaw it out. And you usually do that once or twice, uh, and that's how you treat these tumors. But you are limited by a couple things. So let's go through the, the indications, benefits, limitations, and complications. Well, it's good for small to medium size isolated tumors, like group A or group B, if you're using the international uh, classification. Um, it's, it's good for um, sterilizing injection sites. So we'll talk a little bit later about intravitreal chemotherapy. And so we use cryotherapy to actually sterilize the needle site. And we'll talk about that later. What are the benefits? Well, it's a, a one-time use usually. You can actually um, you know, have, have the machine in your room and you can use it whenever you want. Uh, it's precise, meaning that whatever you freeze, you treat, uh, there's no systemic toxicity. The limitations is that it's hard to get the pr probe posteriorly. And sometimes you don't want to get the probe posteriorly because if you have a tumor next to the optic nerve, you really don't want to freeze the optic, optic nerve. So it's really better for anterior tumors that are a little bit thicker than what laser can handle. Um, and the bad thing about it is that occasionally you can get uh, retinal detachments, you can have hemorrhages, you can, if you cryo the lens, you can get cataracts. Um, it is slightly painful uh, for the child when they wake up, uh, but otherwise it's a good tumor for these, as shown in the picture, these kind of medium to small, small medium tumors that are anterior. So here's a, a picture of me placing the, the cryo probe on the, on the eye, and that's about the size of it. And you can see here at the left-hand picture, there's the picture of the ice ball. And underneath that, that kind of whitish thing is the tumor. And you see that the ice ball is actually completely engulfing uh, the, the peripheral tumor. And that's what you want to do. Sometimes you'll see it actually turn white, but you actually want the ice to be above it. That way you get a full solid freeze throughout the whole tumor. Otherwise, it'll be partially uh, treated and, and tend to recur. The downside about cryotherapy is even though you have maybe a two millimeter, or three millimeter uh, tumor that you're treating, the ice ball has to get fairly big to encompass that, and the scar that you leave is probably double the width of what you're trying to treat. So know that because if you're trying to treat something in a more visual sensitive area, that your scar is going to be fairly big. And you can see that in the periphery or that right side picture where the, you can see that it's a well-treated tumor. It's a fairly small tumor, but the scar around it is big. So how does it work? Well, it actually works really well. 79% uh, of the time, uh, tumors can be cured just by cryotherapy alone. And that's pretty good numbers, especially since we use them in conjunction with other types of chemotherapy or other treatments. And 60% of the time, it only takes one cryo to do it. So it's a good reference and it's a good tool to use for anterior, medium to small tumors, um, that are, that's what you do. Um, so the next category that we're gonna talk about is chemotherapy and there's different types of chemotherapy and there's different ways to uh, administer it. So obviously chemotherapy works by chemically targeting cancer cells that are dividing. There's different classes of agents that we use, alkylating agents, topoisomerase inhibitors, the anthracyclines, and there's different drugs within these classes. Uh, given those different um, types of methods of killing cells, we also have different ways to give them. And the way we give them makes a difference because the concentrations and toxicities uh, are, and um, efficacies are all dependent on those different ways we give it. So we'll talk about the traditional intravenous chemotherapy. And this is one of the first uh, methods or uh, ways that we delivered chemotherapy for retinoblastoma it goes back to the 90s uh, when we noted that people that had systemic chemotherapy, their eyes responded. Uh, 
And so this is good for pretty much groups, international classification groups A through D. Um, we also use it for extraocular disease and metastatic disease, but that's in a different category of dosing. And so those, those people that are treated with uh, extraocular disease or metastatic disease, um, disease have a whole different protocol of high dose chemotherapy, which is not the same as we give for intraocular disease. Um, some of the benefits is, well, we kind of know um, what we get when we, when we use it. So these drugs are used for uh, decades and the safety profile and the side effect profile is pretty well known to most oncologists. It's fairly standardized. So if you give intravenous chemotherapy in Africa uh, with the same doses and the same administration, it's going to be the same as it, if you give it in the United States. And it's not really operator dependent, like laser and cryotherapy. You, know, you need kind of some skills to do that. With intravenous chemotherapy, it's pretty standardized in that you give it through the, uh, the veins and you give the right dose and you know what to expect. It's widely available and uh, it's good for big tumors and um, the ones that aren't amenable to focal treatment. Limitations, well, um, the dose that you can get with intravenous chemotherapy uh, is, is good, but sometimes it's not enough. And really, realistically, you can't cure retinoblastoma with just a intravenous chemotherapy alone. You need something in addition. And so almost 100% of intravenous chemotherapy patients will recur if you don't do something else. And so that something else is your cryotherapy, your laser, um, other types of, of chemotherapy to help, depending on what you're seeing. Uh, so it's really kind of an adjuvant uh, method of giving chemotherapy and not a curative method. So you always need something else with intravenous chemotherapy. Um, it has side effects, right? It, this has the typical side effects that you see with chemotherapy, uh, lower white blood cell counts, risk of infections, hair loss, and it, you need a good oncologist, a pediatric oncologist to manage these complications. Uh, so you need kind of an infrastructure where somebody knows how to give chemotherapy, how to manage the side effects, and those are really important. And it also has significant complications of such as hearing loss, second cancers, infection, and death. So it's, it's not something to be taken lightly in all the chemotherapies because these drugs are, are potent. So here's an example of intravenous chemotherapy. And you can see that a large tumor that was in the macular area had shrunk down uh, nicely. Uh, but again, there's still some fish flesh there and you're gonna need focal treatments to, continue, to make that um, durable response. So timing with intravenous chemotherapy is really important. You can't just be willy-nilly and say, all right, I'm just going to send them to the oncologist or the pediatric oncologist, and uh, they'll come back, they'll be all fine, and I'll see what I can do. You have to do serial exams where you get intravenous chemotherapy, you do your focal treatments, and you work as a team on a monthly kind of repetitive, consistent basis, and you'll get good results. So if you look at some of these um, different papers of how intravenous chemotherapy works. Well, it works really pretty good for groups A through C, uh, up to 100%, um, and groups D and E, not so much. About 50% of the time you can save eyes with those. And these are specific uh, eyes that you can save. A lot of these studies are biased in the fact that the eyes that you couldn't save, we enucleated, and then we only um, publish the ones that we actually thought we could save. And, and of those, we only save 50%. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of intravenous chemotherapy. There are some limitations to it. So that gave us a reason to look for something better, right? A lot of times you give intravenous chemotherapy and you would have really these recurrent subretinal seeds. Um, you know, once the retina is detached uh, from these tumors, the subretinal fluid in that space is filled with microscopic and macroscopic seeds. As the chemotherapy re reduces the size of the big tumors, some of these uh, subretinal seeds don't get a, a toxic enough dose of uh, chemotherapy, and then sometime later they recur. So because of that, we started to say, hey, well, we need more 
drug into the eye. So let's try to give periocular chemotherapy, and that way we can increase the levels to get some of these recurrent seeds. And so um, what's the advantage of this? So let's go through our chart. Um, well, it's good for advanced uh, intraocular retinoblastoma with seeding, right? Subretinal versus vitreous. It's, um, it's not used very much anymore because really it doesn't have the punch that we need, but it's still kind of an adjuvant. And occasionally I'll give you some stats on how it does work. It's just wasn't as good as we thought it would be. So it does increase the intraocular levels of chemotherapy. It's fairly safe because you don't give it in the eye, so there's no risk of spreading outside the eye. Um, but the problem is that it's just not quite enough absorption to get the complete kill that you need to sterilize the eye from tumors. Uh, although it, it will help, and perhaps it'll help enough that you can salvage the eye with other means such as uh, focal treatments. Some of the complications that are associated with it is it is fairly toxic to the extraocular um, tissues, and you'll get scarring, eye muscle dis dysfunction, a lot of inflammation, um, which, you know, when you're trying to save an eye, that's kind of an acceptable side effect if it worked. But again, um, it is a, something in your toolbox that you should know about. Use it when you can. So here's the, con the st stats on it. So in about 12 to 39% of the eyes, um, we found that it actually made the difference and we could save the eye. We noticed that at least almost half of them had these uh, periocular side effects. Um, and this was a large 12 year study that I, I did um, on all the periocular carboplatinums that we did. And so that's, it's kind of a good uh, resource. It's a helpful tool, but not kind of the game changer. So the next way to get chemotherapy to the eye was intraarterial. So the Japanese started to do this um, probably maybe 10 to 15, well actually probably more like 20 to 25 years ago. Um, and we in New York basically kind of used some of the modern day catheters to say, hey, well, why don't we just give a really small amount of chemotherapy to the eye and get a high dose? And so we can do that as shown in the video, here's a catheter that's going into the ophthalmic artery, and you can see the perfusion of the dye into the eye. Um, and this is a way to get kind of a short-lived high dose, significantly higher dose um, of chemotherapy into the eye. And so when we first started this, we were actually fairly amazed of how well it worked. Um, the nice thing is it, it's good for similar uh, classes of retinoblastoma, so basically groups A through E. Uh, it has better control of subretinal seeds uh, and even vitreous seeds, um, and it has a lower systemic level of chemotherapy compared to intravenous chemotherapy. So it was kind of like, yeah, this, this is, seems like it's going to work really well. The problem is that you really need a big setup of people that are um, skilled in interventional neuroradiology. So it, it, you need a good um, interventionalist that can you know, find the artery number one, use limited radiation when doing so, uh, and kind of learns how to use chemotherapies. Because most of these uh, specialists that have um, really great skill in ca um, catheterizing uh, aneurysms and different uh, brain lesions, they're using different chemicals than chemotherapy. And so when they are given the chemotherapy, they kind of treat it like a dye or they're not familiar about it, uh, uh, how it affects the blood vessels. And they can get a lot of early complications until they figure out that this stuff is really kind of vascular toxic. And if you give it in a high concentration, i.e. don't kind of let it ooze in with blood, you're going to get some serious occlusion of arteries and, and really uh, a high profile of um, toxicity. So it takes a, a big learning curve to get those people on board of how to use it safely. Uh, but once that's done, it's a really great tool. Um, you get higher rates of chemotherapy into the eye. Um, you know, there are some variations where people don't have an ophthalmic artery. About 15% of patients will have their um, ophthalmic artery fed from the external carotid. Um, so you have to kind of know the vascular anatomy no shortcuts to get in through the middle meningeal artery to try to uh, backflow it into the eye. So there's, there's 
different ways to give it, and it does require a skilled person. Um, the complications, as we spoke about, can be fairly significant where a vascular occlusion of the um, ophthalmic artery, and that can lead to blindness, inflammation, you can get rashes, there's a possibility of uh, CNS complications if uh, things aren't taken care of properly, if you don't use the ad adequate um, anticoagulation. There's also reactions that you can get um, where patients go hypotensive as kind of a, um, a carotid spasm. And so, you know, there's these subset of new complications that your interventions has to be aware of. Um, most of these are all handled um, by experienced people and aren't a major issue, except in the beginning when you're trying to uh, get somebody to do it correctly. But the results are actually amazing. And so eyes that we would uh, consider hopeless before were saving, and uh, even saving with functional vision. And here's an eye where basically tumors up to the back of the lens, filling the eye, and then after interarterial chemotherapy, everything's regressed and it's still a functional eye. So if we look at the stats on this, it works um, well for groups A through C, uh, almost 100%. And for group D, uh, much better than intravenous chemotherapy, which was around 50%. You can get up to, I think, modern day, I would say it's probably about 85%. And maybe group E's, which were almost always enucleated, we could save maybe a third or almost half of those now. Um, it decreases the uh, length of chemotherapy um, and you have a higher rate of salvage. And there's some papers that we publish that are, can give you a lot of details about that. But the problem is with intraarterial chemotherapy, we still have a challenge with vitreous seeding even though the dose that gets into the eye is about 100 times higher than, than that of intravenous chemotherapy, occasionally, uh, and in all the cases that we can't salvage, it's usually because vitreous seeds don't get enough concentration of drug and recur and have uh, um, you know, multiple recurrence after seeding. So Francis Meunier kind of revitalized, and everybody was really scared to stick a needle into an eye uh, uh, that had retinoblastoma because it has such a high rate of extraocular extension. And if that happens, you kind of uh, lose the game and, and move your, your patient from a contained intraocular disease to a systemic disease. So no one really actually wanted to biopsy retinoblastoma or stick a needle in the eye because of that high rate. But with modern techniques using a very fine needle and cryoing the, um, the needle site, uh, we've had really limited um, complications of giving intravenous chemotherapy uh, for vitreous seeding. So that's what this is. We use a melphalan or topo tecan and we direct it, um, inject it directly into the vitreous to help get rid of um, vitreous seeds. The drug lasts very, uh, a very short time in the vitreous, but it has a very high level, and that um, can actually cause great success in getting rid of those uh, seeds. So here's a picture of kind of the technique we use. Um, we use a small syringe uh, and go about three millimeters from the limbus or 3.2 millimeters from the limbus uh, and inject. And then as we're pulling out, we freeze the needle and the, the needle track uh, with the cryotherapy, remove the needle, seal and sterilize the site. Um, and then that's, that's there. And so topo tecan has this unique characteristic of fluorescing. And so we used blue light in this picture to show you the, the topo tecan that we're injecting. And then you can see it within the vitreous kind of swirling around. Uh, and also you can see that there's none leaking out because you don't want to have anything leaking out, including retinoblastoma. Um, so it's a neat way to kind of demonstrate that. And you can see some of the results. So this is a, a patient that had intra-arterial chemotherapy. And you can see in the bottom left picture that there's multiple recurrent vitreous seeds. And these are clumping and they're actually falling down onto the retina and even starting to, to embed. Uh, after injections of intra-arterial chemotherapy, all those seeds have, had dissolved. And you can see in this patient where there's this giant cloud of really 
diffuse, microscopic, viable uh, vitreous seeds after a couple treatments of intravitreal chemotherapy, you can see that that cloud slowly dissipates. Now, in the beginning, when we were first giving these injections, we would see um, a dramatic effect of the injection, but then there would still be this kind of debris and calcified stuff, and we couldn't tell, is this viable, is this not viable? Um, and we keep on injecting, and some people would inject maybe you know, 20 times, uh, because they didn't see it go away completely. Uh, the trick is that there's, you know, we wrote a couple of papers on, you know, the regression patterns of seeds, but sometimes you'll have a little dusting that's left over and you have to kind of watch that closely, but you don't need to continually inject those patients. And that's a, one of the kind of downfalls that people weren't sure of in the beginning, but we've kind of parsed that out. And it works really well. So if you look at some of the early papers, you know, there's people like, oh yeah, it works 100% of the time. And I never say anything works 100% of the time, but it does work well. Um, the other problem is though, it's toxic. And so for every injection, we actually did a study where we inject, we took an ERG and, uh, before and after. And with every injection, the ERG falls about uh, four or five points per injection. So it is toxic and it can cause some significant toxicity locally to where the high concentration of the drug gets to the retina. Um, so you have to use it sparingly because yeah, you could get rid of all your vitreous seeds, but then you can also chemo nucleate the eye because you just burn out the retina from the toxicity of all the injections. So it's a balancing act of control versus um, salvage of visual function and you have to be mindful of that. Surgery. Well, you know, we've talked about all these high tech things, but a nucleation still is a wonderful uh, treatment and uh, a great tool to take care of advanced group D and group E eyes. Um, in an hour, you can cure a patient with unilateral retinoblastoma for life. And so you have to kind of weigh the risks and benefits of all these fancy treatments to one hour surgery to save the life. And uh, depending on what kind of um, infrastructure you have, if you have a big uh, intraarterial suite and that's no problem, then yeah, perhaps you can go down that road. Uh, but you can also save the patient's life in an hour by doing a good enucleation. Uh, what I will um, stress is that uh, you have to look at the pathology afterwards and you have to assess whether this uh, a nucleated eye is a high risk for metastatic disease and, and then treat that appropriately. Uh, and that's a whole different talk but, uh, the, about the pathology of the nucleated eyes, but it's something that's important if you use that technique. But um, it's quick, it's easy, it's done well. If it's done well, you really make a difference in the patient's life. Um, so don't forget about a nucleation. Here's a nucleated eye. Um, one tip, trip, there, trick is you do want to get a long section of uh, optic nerve because you don't want to have a positive margin because if you do have a positive margin, then it changes your classification from intraocular disease to extraocular disease if there's a tumor within the nerve. And so that's your safety margin. You want to practice on getting a long section uh, for that. Brachytherapy. So plaque brachytherapy is where we use these small discs that have radiation on them. Uh, typically we use radioactive iodine, I-125, but there are other isotopes like ruthenium uh, that, that are good for this. And it's the secret weapon of retinoblastoma treatment. It's good for large recurrences that are localized or localized vitreous seeding. Uh, sometimes it's, it's the salvage where you have this last eye that, of this patient and unfortunately there's this big recurrence that snuck up on you and you know you, you can't give them uh, intravenous or intraarterial chemotherapy anymore because it's just resistant to that and if you use a, uh, a plaque you can get rid of that because these tumors are very radiosensitive. Um, and it's kind of a way that in a lot of the papers that you see are stats in the, in the intravenous days is the way that we got those high stats or using these plaques uh, to try to salvage these eyes. So let's go through the chart. Uh, it's good for solitary uh, tumors, recurrent tumors that are larger than, that, larger than those that can be handled with cryo or laser. 
um, or it can be used for localized um, seeding, either subretinal mostly, but sometimes even localized vitreous seedings. It has a high um, local tumor control rate because of uh, the sensitivity of uh, retinoblastoma to radiation. It's a short surgical uh, procedure and it can avoid chemotherapy or it can work when chemotherapy doesn't. Um, it does require a hospital stay or, or uh, monitoring. You do need a radiation oncologist and somebody that can custom make these uh, plaques. There is a risk of cataract because of the radiation. Um, and there's all the complications that are associated with uh, surgery. But like I said, it's a, it's a really good tool to use for those um, situations. And it doesn't have the same effect on second cancers like external beam radiotherapy, and it doesn't increase the risk of second cancers. And that's important to know because it's such a localized, uh, high dose to the uh, eye, low dose to the surrounding tissues, we haven't seen the increased rate of second cancers that, like we have with external beam therapy. So here's a picture of a plaque under a mus muscle. This is a dummy plaque. Uh, and you can see we marked on the sclera where the <clears throat> tumor is. We positioned the dummy plaque there, mark the uh, suture eyelets, and then put anchoring sutures there, and then replace it with the uh, live plaque. Let it sit in there for usually three to seven days, depending on uh, which isotope you use. And uh, like I said, it, it works very well. So here's a patient that failed intra-arterial chemotherapy with a large recurrent um, peripheral tumor. And we plaque that and you can see afterwards there was a nice regression and no recurrence and we were able to salvage the eye. So if you look at the papers and uh, the stats on how this works, it works about 73 to 95% of the time and you get anywhere from two to 40% uh, side effect um, profile. And the biggest side effect is vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, and that can happen later in, later down the, uh, the road where some of these already compromised vessels treated with, red, with radiation will um, bleed a little bit. And that can complicate things as well. And then one of the reasons why we lose the eyes, um, and it's not 100% control. Then external beam radi radiation. And prior to the chemotherapy age, uh, External beam was one of the mainstays of treatment until we found out down the road that this increased the rate of second cancers. And so uh, in the field of radiation, uh, the risk of osteo osteosarcomas uh, could seem to be significantly uh, elevated by using external beam. And there's been a wide uh, movement to minimize radiation to these children that have bilateral disease or germline mutations uh, because of that. And so currently, um, I haven't used external beam radiotherapy for over a decade, maybe even almost 15 years now uh, for that reason. But as a last resort, uh, it still has some merit and it's efficacy. We can use higher, we can use you know, specialized IMRT or different ways to minimize the dose into surrounding tissues, uh, but you still carry the risk of second cancers and it works any, around 50%. Uh, and the side effect profile is around 100%. Um, so it is a, a last resort if you're trying to save and salvage one eye in a monocular patient. Um, but the risks and secondary cancer risks are real. So that kind of summarizes all the tools for intraocular retinoblastoma. And uh, I'm just gonna run through a few questions um, to see if uh, you guys are interested in kind of showing me what you learned and you know, what do you think? So the first question, so vitreous seeds are best handled with intravenous chemotherapy, three drugs for six months. So the majority, I think two thirds of us thought that that was false. I think that's, that's a good answer because you remember when we were talking about the problems of different tumors, vitreous seeds are the ones that are floating and the chemotherapy has the hardest time to get to it. So currently intravenous chemotherapy has the worst, um, uh, the worst 
control rate of vitreous seeds. And that's when we would say, all right, well, we're giving intravenous chemotherapy, but because we have uh, vitreous seeds, we're going to add intravitreal injections to boost that effect. And so that's why we would do that. So that's a good answer from everybody. Let's do the next one. <clears throat> Another true or false. Brachytherapy, radiation, has been associated with increased risk for second cancers in patients with germline mutations in and bilateral retinoblastoma. It's not fair because we just talked about that, but let's see how you guys do. So just like we said uh, before, plaque is a kind of a precise way to give a low-dose radiation um, or a high-dose radiation to the tumor, low-dose radiation to the surrounding tissue, and has not been associated with the increased risk that you see with uh, external beam. Let's go to the next one. Cryotherapy can, uh, oh, sorry about the typo, is best used for the anterior tumors greater than four millimeters thick. True or false? It's a little bit of a trick question, but see, see how you did. So that it's tricky because cryotherapy can and is used for anterior tumors, um, and it's the better treatment for that. But usually, if they're greater than four millimeters thick, uh, they kind of get outside the range of what the cryo can handle. So that's kind of the upper limit of what I use it for. Um, you can kind of push the limit for bigger tumors, but again, this efficacy follows dramatically. So I like to keep it under four millimeters of thickness for that. Um, and if, if it is greater than four millimeters, then that would be a good uh, tumor if you don't have chemotherapy or if you already use chemotherapy uh, for a plaque. So if you want to treat it without using chemotherapy, plaque brachytherapy would be good for an anterior tumor that's greater than four millimeters. All right, let's see what we have next. One common side effect uh, of another typo, <laughs> intravitreal uh, melphalan chemotherapy is, is decreased ERG function. Good. I think everybody jumped on that one pretty well. So yeah, intravitreous uh, melphalan can cause uh, significant toxicity and decrease the, the function of the ERG. All right, last one. Uh, for extrafovial international classification uh, retinoblastoma group A, tumors are best treated with which? That's excellent. So I think everybody got that. Um, so for that, group A is the small tumors, right? Extrafovial, uh, I put that in because you don't really want to laser or cryo the fovea. Uh, so if you have an extrafovial small tumor, local treatment's the best with laser or cryo. Uh, so I think everybody got that. Well, I really appreciate you attending this webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. So the question is, could you please explain the steps in the approach for intraarterial chemotherapy? So when I use intraarterial chemotherapy, it's usually for group D eyes uh, that have either subretinal or vitreous seeding or both. Uh, in patients that are usually bilateral, uh, but it can use it in unilateral cases if a nucleation isn't the best way to treat it. Um, and in that case, you know, we'll start to do um, intraarterial chemotherapy. And so we have three drugs that we can use. We can use melphalan, uh, carboplatinum, and tobotecan. And if it's a what I call a bad group D, which means it has a really big tumor that has a lot of vitreous seeds and a lot of subretinal seeds, you know, then what I would recommend is using all three drugs at once. So we do triple therapy of melphalan, uh, topo, and carbo. And we do typically one session every month for about three months and then extend it uh, depending on the response. Uh, that on average, it's about each child requires about 3.6 um, sessions of 
intraarterial chemotherapy. Now that's in addition to seeing the patient under anesthesia every uh, treatment cycle and either lasering, giving intravitreal injections of chemotherapy, or treating kind of focally those tumors. So a standard patient I would see, I'd say, all right, this is an advanced eye or advanced eyes. They're going to get intraarterial chemotherapy. Uh, I'm going to see them back in a month. We'll see how it, it, it works. Uh, we'll treat anything that looks like it's um, possibly treated with focal treatment, and they'll go for their second uh, cycle of intraarterial and continue until we're pretty confident that everything is under control and then just follow. So what's the normal, the next question is, what is the normal interval between intravitreal chemotherapy and what uh, is the usual volume that is injected? So intravitreal, you know, we've, we've moved from every week to every month. And typically now, you know, we used to give it every week for uh, four or five or six times. But currently, what I do now is give uh, melphalan or topo tecan, but I like melphalan. I usually give about 25 um, micrograms in 0 0.07. I think it works out to be 0 0.07 cc, so a very small volume, using a 33-gauge needle. Um, and I'll do that monthly in conjunction with... Uh, my intraarterial, if I'm if they're in the beginning of treatment and it's a high risk guy, or if it's a salvage one, then I'll just do it monthly and observe. So for the next question is for tumors amenable to both IAC or intraarterial chemotherapy or plaque, which mode of treatment would you recommend? So I'll use plaque for a solitary um, tumor that is too big to treat with, um, with a focal treatment where there's no other seeds or anything else. Now, if, if they have vitreous seeds or if they have um, subretinal seeds and they're kind of a group D or diffuse, then I'll definitely go with intraarterial chemotherapy. If they don't, and I want to avoid chemotherapy altogether and it's their only tumor, then plaque would be great, right? So it's one of those things that it, they don't come around very often that you have just a large tumor that has kind of either very localized seeding or no seeding and no other tumors. Um, you can avoid the whole intraarterial chemotherapy process if you have that. The problem is that doesn't come along very often. Usually bigger tumors will have seeds um, or they'll have multiple tumors. And so you don't get the opportunity to use that um, solely. So most of the time you're going to end up with intraarterial chemotherapy. But in those rare situations where you have uh, just one tumor, it's pretty big, you can't handle it with a focal treatment, plaque would be kind of a home run. So for like an early unilateral case, sometimes you'll see that. All right, one more question. Um, we have a young Caucasian girl, eight years, with a nevus on the conjunctiva, very close to the limbus. And also on the cornea, it appeared three months ago. How often, how often do you watch this, I think is the question. And so in adolescence, you'll see this is the, high, the, the time where most of these lesions grow. And even if you take them off surgically, uh, you'll see high indexes of uh, mitotic figures uh, and high mitotic rates, and sometimes it's confused with, with melanoma, but most of the time it's a nevus. So in those patients, probably I would watch them every maybe four months for the first year until it stabilizes. If it starts to get really uh, concerning having feeder vessels that are larger than the normal caliber vessels around it, growing onto the cornea uh, in disregard for the, the anatomical borders, then I think surgery might be better. But most of the time, these rapidly growing lesions in adolescence are benign, and they just kind of go through this growth spurt. But I think yeah, I would keep a close eye on it, especially if there's um, 
uh, a concern that it's it's atypical of a period. You know, if it has ulcerations or things like that, the, that would be more um, towards a concerning lesion. But statistically, these um, these lesions are well behaved. So survival rate in retinoblastoma. Recently, this has kind of been controversial um, in the United States, uh, and people have touted the 100% uh, survival. That's not true. I think that there's probably uh, maybe 3% um, mortality rate for bad cases of retinoblastoma in the United States. Other places in different parts of the world, it, it varies. But I think in the United States, I think we're anywhere from zero to three, zero to four percent. Um, what else? How do you identify retinoblastoma in newborns? Um, by doing a good exam and looking at them very closely. I think that you know if you want to be super high tech and scan the whole uh, retina with uh, OCT, that would be interesting and, and effective. Uh, not so practical, um, but I think that at four weeks, typically I'll watch anybody with a, a family history. Uh, I'll see them at four weeks, and usually we'll be able to detect small tumors at that time. And rarely do we have tumors that are kind of out of control by that portion. Um, with the precision of our focal treatments, um, catching a 0.5 millimeter tumor versus a um, one millimeter tumor, I think that the scar that we produce is fairly comparable. Um, so I don't think that that uh, gap in time is super um, important, though I know that people are trying to you know, get ahead of that. And I think it's a great pitch to try to do. Um, but that's my feelings on that. That's about it. One more question. So if you look at our um, screening paper that, um, that we published in ophthalmology maybe a couple of years ago, three years ago, gives us the, um, screening patterns that we kind of recommended for uh, children and, and um, uh, siblings of children and their relative risks and frequency of scans. And I think that's a, it's a good baseline. So if you haven't looked at it, it should be a good one to kind of look, at, look up. Uh, but if you have a mutation negative child um, with a family history, I usually still screen them uh, every six months uh, till the age of um, 38 months or 28 months um, just to be sure because sometimes you know we can't find their mutation or it's a mosaic and you don't get it um, so again if the test was a hundred percent then I'd say you don't need to check them at all and most likely that's the case however there are exceptions to that and you don't want to miss that so I still I'm conservative and, and check them. So post-nucleation pain, it's a difficult question without knowing the details. Um, typically just the nucleation itself, long-term doesn't have pain. Now it could be a complication of no prosthetic, prosthetic, implant, no implant, um, those kind of things. Um, it could be surface related. So it's, it's hard to actually, without knowing all the details, answer that one. Um, so anyways, I'm really glad that everyone had an interest and I hope, hope that you enjoyed the talk. Um, and like I said, I'm in New York City. So if you need anything, please feel free to contact me uh, and good luck treating all your retinoblastoma patients.